Welcome to the Legacy Pioneers Oral History Initiative, a part of the Bronx Latino History Project. Today is Tuesday, August 22nd, 2023. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and archivist for the Bronx County Historical Society. I am here with Michelle Jordan, who will co-interview this oral history. Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, so my name is Michelle Jordan. I am a current graduate student at the Palmer School of Library and Information Science and creator of the Legacy Pioneers Oral History Initiative. Um, this initiative is spearheaded from the physical archival collection of my late grandfather, George Rodriguez, community advisory board chairman of Lincoln Hospital and community board one for over 30 years. Um, the aim is to fully capture the voices, experiences, and spirit of community leaders of the South Bronx. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Sanchez. Absolutely. And we are joined today by Jose R. Sanchez, president of Norwegian American Hospital based in Chicago, former vice president of Generations Plus Northern Manhattan Health Network, the largest healthcare network in the largest public healthcare system in the United States and former CEO of Lincoln Medical and Mental Health Center. Welcome, Mr. Sanchez. Would you like to introduce yourself or do we leave anything out? No, I, I don't think a couple of corrections that I will make. I changed the name of the hospital to Humble Park Health now. Uh, so that's the only uh, correction. Um, I am Jose R. Sanchez, so I have uh, the... Um, uh, the privilege to serve the uh, the Bronx community and New York City uh, for uh, <clears throat> over f uh, 15 years in the position that I held as a senior vice president of Generation Plus Health Network and also CEO for Lincoln Hospital. Uh, and I'm here to uh, collaborate with you and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm speaking to Michelle because I, I love you, great, great grandfather. And he loved you. <laughs> he always spoke so highly of you. Good. Great. Mr. Sanchez, would you like to begin? Uh, we begin all our oral histories by asking about your family history, background, and where your parents are from. Yeah, I was uh, actually born in um, Puerto Rico, um, uh, relocated to uh, New York at uh, the age of uh, 15 and a half. Uh, I attended Brandeis High School in, uh, in Manhattan, uh, graduated from City College of New York in 1977, uh, went to Adelphi University uh, for my graduate work. Uh, which I completed in uh, 1979. Um, I have been an um, active member of the Latino community uh, uh, since I, I finished college. Um, I have received uh, two honorary doctorate from uh, the College of Podiatry Medicine in New York City. And I also from the uh, San George University Medical School as well for my contribution to healthcare uh, in the city uh, and also in the city of Chicago, which I relocated back in uh, 2010 uh, after I had spent uh, all of my life in, in, in New York. Uh, and I'm working in the most disadvantaged communities um, began my career in, in Brooklyn, uh, working at Brookdale Hospital. And then after that, I went to uh, Rome Psychiatry Center as a CEO. Uh, and and uh, later on became the CEO for North Central Bronx, uh, CEO of uh, Metropolitan Hospital, uh, CEO of uh, Lincoln Hospital. And then I also had the responsibility of leading uh, Harlem Hospital uh, for about nine years. So I had spent uh, a significant uh, number of years uh, actually working in healthcare and in the Bronx and in Manhattan, but some component of a little bit of time in, in, in Brooklyn, about four, four and a half years, 
Uh, and then when I left there, I went to the Bronx. I never left until I came to Chicago in 2010. And I actually lead here uh, this organization for about 13 years. Humble Park Health uh, served the um, um, <clears throat> Puerto Rican community and uh, in the city of Chicago. This is the larger Puerto Rican community in uh, our um, uh, in our city. So, um, as, as you could see, I have spent my whole career. Um, whatever the word Puerto Ricans, that's where they sent me. And I end up there. And I have spent a lot of years there. That's great. That's great. Now, you you were in Puerto Rico till you were 15. Can you tell us about the town, the pueblo in Puerto Rico? And what were your earliest recollections or memory about life? Well, I uh, actually um, uh, went to uh, La Salle Academy uh, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was born in, uh, in Rio Piedra. Uh, and um, uh, my family was in Guaynabo. Uh, we actually um, uh, lived there for a while. Um, and then after I uh, uh, came to uh, New York, went back, uh, you know, my parents actually passed away. We inherited the house in Guaynabo. I kept it. I sold it just last uh uh, last December, and then we actually owned an apartment in Isla Verde, uh, where I thought I would, at some point when I left Lincoln that I was going to retire there, but instead of going to Puerto Rico, I came to Chicago, and I've been here for over 13 years now. Wow. wow. And uh, do, do you remember the uh, the year and, and the reasons why uh, you and your family came to New York City? Well, I didn't come with my family. I actually uh, came to New York City uh, on my own to live with an uncle who was my father's uh, brother. And uh, my family never relocated to to New York City. They always lived there. They stayed there. And I used to go back and see them. Um, but the first time that I left, I didn't I go back until... Uh, five years later, and then after that, I, I went back about 12 years uh, later. And so I, I became a, a diehard New Yorker, so I, I, I never went back uh, to the to the island. Um, I, I go there um, um, once in a while. My mother passed away uh, about eight years ago, and I actually don't go there that often. Uh, the last couple of times that I have been in the island is I'm um, a very good friend of the uh, the Miranda family. So I saw uh, Lee Manuel Miranda uh, growing up as a young man. Uh, I used to be uh, his mother's boss when I worked at Bronx Lebanon Hospital. Uh, and she was a clinical uh, psychologist. Uh, I have a daughter who is a uh, a doctor. So um, <clears throat> her, uh, my daughter, and Lee Manuel Miranda actually grew up together. They were approximately, there were about six of seven families that were highly professional uh, in New York uh, back then. So we all kind of uh, uh, spent a lot of time together. We are children, we are families. and. Um, so Lee Manuel Miranda was one of those kids uh, that was part of this group of families uh, growing up. When the when his parents uh, Luz and Luis got married, um, and uh, several years ago, um, um, my daughter uh, and Lee Manuel were the two little kids that actually uh, my daughter was the flower girl and Lee Manuel was brought the rings to his parents. So, and um, uh, every time that he uh, goes to Puerto Rico to present himself there, then I usually 
get called to go and I meet them over there. But uh, uh, but everyone, uh, we, we were uh, very close. The, the same person who wrote Carlitos Way uh, was also part of the group uh, of this family of, I'm talking about friends that we consider ourselves or, or family. And um, uh, we have the first member of the city council, Dominican city council, Guillermo Linares was also part of this group. So his kids also were raised with our children uh, together. Uh, the first Dominican judge uh, actually was part of this group. Uh, and there were Dominicans and Puerto Ricans raising uh, the children <clears throat> uh, together at that time. And, um, and of course, every, everyone became famous and, and successful. And then we all went our own way. And we actually talk to each other now once in a while. And um, uh, so that's kind of the history how I got to New York and how I actually uh, conducted my own uh, life there. Wow, wow. And what was the first New York City neighborhood you moved into where your uncle lived? Well, I lived in Manhattan on 108th Street uh, on, on Manhattan Avenue uh, between uh, 108th and 109th Street. At that time was... Um, in no man's land, nobody want to live there. So <laughs> you was I remember. I remember I lived in a, in a, in a, in a building with no elevator, and there was five floors that you have to go flight flights that you got to go up every day, going up and coming down, even going to the supermarket, going to the laundry place with clothes, struggling, going five floors up with no elevator. So I I lived there for. Uh, uh, a few years, and then um, I moved to Upper Manhattan and 133rd Street on Amsterdam Avenue, and then uh, was attending City College at that time, and then I got married in 1981, and uh, we moved to Queens, and now we went back to Manhattan. We still own an apartment in in Manhattan on certain place between 53rd and 54th. And that's what the family is. Um, my daughter, who is a doctor, is practicing medicine at the first hospital that I had a job, which was uh, Brookdale Hospital when I finished my career, my, my, my degree. Uh, so, um, uh, so um, uh, my wife was um, a New York State uh, Commissioner uh, under uh, um Andrew Cuomo and actually she had to um, um step down after the that he left uh government um uh, but you know she worked for the New York City Department of Mental Health uh was commissioner for mental health services in Nassau County uh then after that became part of the cabinet of the governor so we we have always been in in in, in sort of kind of politics, but in areas of serving communities and serving people. So, uh, and now we have a daughter that is really serving human beings who need surgery. Uh, and so we very proud of that. Uh, we have two grandchildren. One is two and the other one is five weeks. So, so wow, we are congratulations. doing well. Thank you. Wow. So, um, Although your first neighborhoods were, were in Manhattan, uh, can, can you tell us about your earliest memories on 108th Street and 133rd Street? What was life like during that time on the streets, the sights, the sounds? What did you experience? Well, I mean, it, it, the um, uh, 108th Street uh, in Manhattan, Manhattan Avenue was uh, uh, a a Latino community uh, with Puerto Ricans being minor and a big influx of Dominicans in that area. Uh, but it was uh, newcomers into the city, uh, people struggling to uh, make it 
life and survive in in uh, New York City. Um, I actually, while I, while I was living there, uh, I had the I always I had the privilege to do certain things. So I, I I got a job at a grocery store on 108th and Columbus Avenue, okay. and and I used to work there after school. Uh, so I spent a lot of time. I went to Brandeis High School on 84th Street, took the bus, went straight into the grocery store. I worked from actually uh, two o'clock until midnight every day while I was going to school. And I, I struggle with uh, getting homework done uh, because I'm see I was in New York just by myself. And uh, I needed to support myself. So at that time, I was uh, 18, um, like 15 and a half, 16, 17 uh, during that period. Um, but it was a, uh, a minority neighborhood. Uh, it, it was at that time uh, a, a poor uh, community. Uh, a number of uh, uh, empty lots uh, in the area. Uh, I, I usually go to that area when I'm in New York, and I, you could see the difference between what it was, uh, you know, 40 years ago and where we are today. Um, 133rd Street was uh, totally different. So we, uh, I was um, in a neighborhood that was primarily uh, African American uh, in there. Uh, uh, many projects right in front of the building. I live on 501 West 133rd Street uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, all of these projects in front of us were all African Americans. Uh, and um, uh, that was also a very poor community. Uh, it was also bringing in. Uh, there were Cubans uh, at that time there that actually left and they went across the river to New Jersey. And then um, uh, Dominicans came in and there were just a few Puerto Ricans uh, in the area. Uh, however, City College, which I attended, uh, was kind of a real minority college uh, and it has uh, the majority of uh, students at City College were Puerto Ricans at that time. Just a few Dominicans, uh, some Blacks, but primarily the population was all Anglo. Uh, significant number of, uh, of Jewish background in the school at that time. So we were like a tiny minority. And, and, and the thing was, that we were kind of isolated to some extent as minorities going to college. So we had our own group. Uh, the fact that we were so minority brought uh, a Puerto Rican, few Dominican, African-American all together at that time. And uh, we congregated always in the same location uh, continuously. So it was a, uh, uh, by necessity, we needed to kind of uh, stay together because we were not really welcome uh, in the university uh, at, at that time. Uh, I'm talking about um, uh, 1973, 1977 uh, when I kind of graduated and I and I left there. And, and I felt that it was difficult uh, in... Uh, there, uh, where we were in the middle of a poor neighborhood, because if the school is in 133rd Street and uh, in that whole area, uh, and and then I thought that I I had a bat there, but then I went to Adelphi University in, in 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 Long Island, and then I remember going for an interview, and uh, that time I was dating my wife, and I called her on the phone and I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it here. And she says, why? And I said, because everybody's white. I mean, I'm the only Latino here, you know, in the whole place. And they are not even African-American. Everybody's Jewish here. 
and uh, and then I had a and the reason that I went to Delphi University was because I had a history professor at City College uh, who was Jewish, and his wife was the vice dean of the graduate school. And then he says, I'm going to help you. At that time, in 1977, uh, only 5% of Latinos had a college degree. And, mm -hmm. and he expressed an interest in saying, I'm going to help you. I didn't even know what I was going to do at that time. I just finished graduate school. He says, you want to go to graduate school? And I said, well, I don't know. And and then finally, he kind of convinced me, uh, helped me out to get a scholarship, went there, uh, completed the degree. And uh, right in the middle of the completing my uh, uh, graduate degree, they told me that they didn't have any more money to give me um uh, money to pay for the tuition and um, the and I said well I'm going to transfer to a school in New York City uh, that I could complete my degree because it doesn't make any sense for me to travel 30 miles out of the city to go to Adelphi University in Long Island uh, and that doesn't make any sense and then um, uh, they didn't want to let, let me go because they were only five students in graduate school in the entire school. And they got me a little job in the uh, admission office re reviewing applications of people who were applying to a school. And then that didn't work out. And then there was the 1199 union uh, had a program to organize the workers in Newark, New Jersey, and they told me that if I would organize the workers in a Portuguese community in Newark, they will finish to pay for my school. I raised my hand and I said, I will do it. <clears throat> and I spent um, uh, a whole year going from factory to factory, organizing the uh, workers uh, to unionize and to uh, be protected and have due process and employment uh, and get benefits. And, and that's how I finished the school. And then I went back to New York City and, and, I, and I spent my whole career there. Wow, that, that, that's an amazing story. I mean, you were, you were so busy. So that brings me to the time frame, you know, that you're speaking of 73 through 77, you had mentioned, you know, just because this is 50 years of hip hop here in the Bronx, you know, what was your exposure to those different elements of hip hop during that time? We're talking graffiti, rap, break dancing, and DJ. Can you talk to us about that experience just a little? Well, I, I didn't actually really benefit a great deal from any of that because, um, you know, I have uh, uh, self responsibility to, to myself, which I have no basically family in, in New York City. So I needed to really focus on um, basically um, uh, work part-time, go to school, and try to really behave uh, well so that I could make something out of myself. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm, I mean, I remember the graffitis were and uh, uh, really quite noticed uh, in the subways and in high riser uh, um, everywhere. Um, um, never did any of that. Um, uh, although um, on, on Saturday night, I actually got together and I went to uh, a few clubs and, and danced, especially in the Bronx. Uh, uh, at the times that... Uh, the um, uh, we have uh, a, a number of uh, Puerto Rican uh, artists, uh, singers uh, at that time. You know, uh, Willie Colon, uh, uh, Barrero from Cuba, um, and um, Johnny Pacheco. Uh, at the time that there was uh, Fania was like the music, Latin music uh, at that time. And uh, 
So I enjoy some of it, but not to the extent uh, that I participate in any in any of that simply because I was uh, someone who actually uh, had to take my life very serious because I was on my own and I didn't have anybody else to uh, protect me. Um, I did actually, um, um, uh, and I remember I cut a couple of classes when uh, when the days were getting warmer to to go to the beach uh, and get in the train and go with the go with the girls and go with the boys. Uh, but it was always very self constrained in the sense that I was not uh, went overboard because of my own personal responsibility to myself. So, and, and that's how I did it. Oh, that's 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 admirable for for such a young man. So, uh, you know, definitely need to be lauded for that. Uh, Thank you <laughs> for your efforts and, and and resisting all of those uh, temptations because you you lived during a very vibrant time. Salsa was at its height, you know, and hip hop was was beginning to grow. So, very exciting. Um, now, you went to college or you got your degree in social work. Can you tell yeah. us about the motivation for that? Well, it was a, uh, it was a practical choice in my life. So I, um, I finished school and um, I finished college. And then um, uh, this professor was the one who says, uh, do you want to be a, a social worker? And I said, no, I'm not interested in doing that. Uh, because I was uh, in the school of architect. I wanted to be an architect. So I began college and I completed three years. Um, probably if the advancement in technology that exists today would have happened at that time, I probably would have been an architect rather than a social worker. And I became somewhat a very practical person in my life, moving as a young man. So I will always felt that if I couldn't do this, then I could do something else. Uh, but when I completed the third year in, um, in architecture, um, now the assignments and the work was intensified and required almost full-time work. And I knew that I couldn't do it because I needed to work and support myself. And that's when I decided to complete my degree in psychology, which I did. And then, um, uh, and then this opportunity to go to social work came up. And the first time the this Jewish professor presented it to me, I actually said, no, and that's not what I want to do. And I walked away. Uh, about two months later, I went back to him and I said, listen, I thought about what you said. Uh, what will be um, the, uh, hold on one second. Let me turn off this. Off. Of course. Sorry about that. And then I, I said to uh, to him, well, listen, what is it that you have to offer? Because I feel like I have no option in my life. And then he actually gave me his wife's uh, name and actually uh, went to school and completed it. But you remember, I... I became a community organizer and a union organizer in order to complete uh, that degree. Um, and then after I complete, completed that degree, I went back to the School of Architecture for another one semester. And then after that, I said, finished. I don't think I could do this anymore. And then I just uh, uh, began a career that it wasn't unplanned, but it was practical because it gave me the opportunity to get a college degree uh, get a degree in uh, professional degree, which is uh, is pretty much required uh, to be successful today, uh, and uh, has been a probably the most uh, uh, practical 
degree that I used and I was a uh, clinical social worker. So I, uh, I treated uh, young people, families, and the group psychotherapy to some courses on family therapy as well. And then I did that for about 10 years. And then after that, I just felt that I needed to have a bigger impact in people's life. And I wanted to get more on policy uh, and impacting a uh, larger scale uh, uh, people. And uh, and I left that and I just became um, an administrator. Uh, and um, I have been president of the six different hospitals, uh, five in New York and one here in Chicago. And um, I take my work beyond the boundaries of the hospital. So I get involved in a lot of community organization, working with community-based agencies, working with children in the community, uh, which is probably the social work part of it that I didn't anticipate it. And then um, managed uh, the larger healthcare network in New York City for almost 15 years. Uh, that's when I met uh, my friend, uh, my brother, George Rodriguez, during that time. So going off of that, Mr. Sanchez, your journey as a Puerto Rican leader in healthcare is really inspiring. And I know in 2009, you were named one of the most influential Latinos in the country by Hispanic Business Magazine and New York Times affiliate for leadership. Um, could you share more about what was it, what was the importance to you for representing the Puerto Rican community, especially at the time, as you said, there were very limited college educated Puerto Ricans. And how did that, how did this drive um, your commitment to leadership, especially in underserved um, communities? I mean, that's a, um, a great question. Um, I uh, actually, um, um, it was, it was something that was inborn. Uh, it wasn't really planned. Um, uh, it was, um, uh, you know, being in Brooklyn, um, seeing the devastation of the community. Um, I remember uh, working at Brookdale um, that we would go to the train station and we have to work in groups because otherwise we would get mugged. No one walked to the train by herself or by himself. We always waited for the group. And I felt that we needed to uh, uh, transform neighborhood and create um, opportunities uh, for the next generation of people. And uh, it required leaders to do that. Uh, and it requires to influence policies and it will require to work with elected officials and people that are in levels that could make decisions. Um, and um, uh, I'm having a voice because even when we were, uh, when we were professionals, uh, we were not heard by anyone. Um, I mean, I remember um, um, Ed Catch, which I consider to be perhaps uh, one of the best mayor in the city, but he was the first mayor in our city. And uh, Pastor, you could, you could correct me with this, that created the, uh, Office of Hispanic Affair uh, under Rafael Esparra, Puerto Rican PhD teacher. And then after that was Luis Miranda who took uh, that office. So that office became a link to a group of us to demand bilingual, bicultural services in the city of New York. So now we're talking about leaders demanding response from government to take care 
or the or the need of our community. And we established uh, at Lincoln Hospital, the first bilingual, bicultural mental health services in, in, the, in the city of New York. And then we were able to create another one in Long Island, which I can recall at this time. So we were focusing on leading that. But we needed to put our own people in position of leadership. I mean, I remember um, I was part of the uh, uh, National Association of Social Workers, uh, the Association of Mental Health Professionals, and they're actually demanding that we would have uh, commissioners in the city to represent our interests. And, and during uh, that time, um, we also were able to identify Dr. Luis Marco, who was the head of the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation, uh, who was commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. Now we're beginning to get some traction. And now he moved from the commissioner to be the president of, of that. And then he brought me in as chief for staff for him. And, and I began to develop relationships we elected officials in New York City, and I was the liaison between New York and the state, New York City and the state. And I developed a lot of relationships there. And it was about getting in a position of, of leadership to be able to effect change mm -hmm. in our communities. So that's how my, it was inborn, it was natural, but we always knew that I wanted to make a difference there. And um, and I think the rest is kind of history to some extent. I mean, I remember, you know, not going to uh, actually trying to get out of um, um at Delphi University that I couldn't get in, which I felt that I would never um, be there uh, because, you know, I didn't feel that I was welcome. There were too many Caucasians there. Um, but then I graduated in 1979. In 1996, I get a call from the president of the, of the school and I didn't even know who he was. He he tracked me. He found me. And he says, um, you know, we had tracked your career. You have been, you had an incredible career. And um, and says, uh, this year, I'd like to honor you by giving you the, uh, the, uh, I uh, uh, award of the year to you in 1996. Oh, wow. So you go from, and that was uh, <clears throat> a recognition for all the work that I have been doing uh, in, 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 in New York City. Now, I will tell you this. I have excelled in everything that life has given me. And, and, it, and it kind of I give you an example. I ended up to be the CEO for North Central Bronx. And at that time, North Central Bronx is right next to Montefiore. As a matter of fact, they have bridges that, that actually exchange patients and people cross over back and forth. I got called to take over the hospital because the city of New York wanted to sell the hospital to Montefiore. And they asked me, if I will be able to do that. And I say, yes. But anyway, one of the strategy that they have was that I will fail the joint commission or the hospital, that they will be able to justify the sale by the failure of the hospital, not to meet all of the requirements of a healthcare institution. And then I said to myself, I just cannot do that. 
as a young professional, I can open myself in a position that I'm going to allow an institution to fail that way the city could sell it. So anyway, um, the inspection came, which they wanted me to fail. And then I excel in the inspection. So the hospital got fully accredited. Right. And then I get a call from City Hall that they didn't want me there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they moved me out of there. But you think about it. I wanted to have a, a great career. I wanted to make sure that I represent my community, my Puerto Rican community everywhere. And, and they asking me to sacrifice myself as a professional, that I will carry my resume, that I failed to get the recognition and the accreditation of a hospital in New York City. I just couldn't make that happen. So anyway, I got uh, And um, um, then uh, I I actually went to work uh, because every hospital that had a problem in New York City, they called me to go and take care of it. Lincoln Hospital was one of those. Lincoln Hospital was losing about $30 million a year. I got called and they told me, do you think that you could turn around this hospital? And I did. And when I left after 12 years that I was leading Lincoln, uh, we were making, you know, 30 and $40 million a year. Instead of losing, we were making that. The ambulatory care uh, uh, expansion of Lincoln Hospital, I did that. The new Harlem Hospital in New York City, I did that, working with the city uh, government. Uh, and um, I felt that I I could do that. In, in the sense that my leadership was, I didn't go to school to be a leader. It was an inborn, it was a commitment to people, mm -hmm. a commitment to community. You know, right now, um, just Michelle, I will tell you this. Um, we had a failing hospital here in Chicago uh, that it was closing and I'm in my office and my phone rings and it's, is the governor of the state of Illinois and says, hey, I heard that you had turned around all of these hospitals. I need help. Can you help me out with this hospital? And, and then we had a conversation for about half hour. And then he says, what do you need uh, to help me out? And I said, well, I would like to do a full assessment of the hospital and see whether the hospital is viable and what are the areas that we need to work on. And he says, well, how much do you need? And I said, well, about $200,000. And he says, $200,000? Uh, okay. Can you do it with one fifty? And I said, send it, and I will take care of it. Next day, the governor wired $150,000 into the hospital account for me to do the assessment. Wow. And what he says to me was, I understand that you are the best hospital operator in our state. And I've been here 13 years. I'm not even from here, from this city. I mean, I have a friend of mine who says to me, uh, who is a lawyer who, as a matter of fact, I'm having dinner with him tonight. He says, we don't even accept people from Chicago the way we have accepted you mm -hmm. because you have an ability to connect to people in a way that people trust you. Because what you do, you delivered what you said. So that's how I got into uh, uh, a leadership role. And, and I don't think anyone, anyone in the history of Lincoln Hospital have let Lincoln for 12 years. Mm -hmm. I was the only one who had let, nobody had break my record yet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no one have done that and um but i had the inspiration of many people who um worked with me um i only had a little bit of trouble at lincoln during the period where 
uh, Rudy Giuliani was uh, mayor uh, because um, he didn't, they, that administration didn't get along with uh, Freddie Ferrer. And, and I remember going to City Hall when I got a call um, to take over Lincoln Hospital. And I, I tell you a very simple story, how things happen. So they have no leaders at Lincoln Hospital. And then I get a call to see if I wanted to go there. But then I needed to be a Democrat, a Republican at that time. And, um, and I get questioned about my political association, that I was a registered Democrat. And they didn't want to deal with anybody that was not a Republican. But then one of our own, one of the great leaders, Puerto Ricans, whether people want to agree or not, who have, who was the first in everything in New York, Herman Badillo, was a friend of mine. And Herman recommended me. Wow. And when I walk into City Hall, the only thing they say, you are coming recommended by a good friend of ours to take over Lincoln Hospital. We only have one question. And that question will be, Mr. Freddie Ferrer, the borough president, is not one of our friends. How will you be leading Lincoln when Freddie Ferrer is going to be there? And I said, I'm loyal to the work that I do, and I will be loyal to work for you and the people of the Bronx. And he extended his hand and he says, welcome to the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation. That's incredible. And that was, it is about leadership. It's about building relationship. It's about working with people who are Democrats, working with people who are Republicans, working with people who are independents. It is, see, I don't consider myself a politician, but there is a lot of politics in whatever we do in our life. Uh, I consider myself a healthcare leader, politician, but I know that from time to time, I have to go to Washington and meet with senators, with uh, members of Congress to advocate on behalf of the things that I need. And um, I, leadership also is about being humble mm -hmm. and change role and adapt to circumstances that exist in front of you. It's not to have a tie and a jacket and have the title CEO and sit in an office. When I came to Chicago, after I had taken this hospital for about a month, the governor of the state of Illinois announced a $3.5 billion cut on the Medicaid program, which is our uh, blood and bread, uh, this organization. And I just didn't know what I was gonna do. Here's a hospital that is bleeding just about to be closed. I came in to turn around the hospital. Now the governor is saying, we're going to turn this. So what did I do? I went to uh, the New Life Covenant Church, talked to the pastor. He organized some leaders in the community. Um, and they asked me, what do you wanna do? And I said, I wanna organize a protest in Springfield. I wanna go to the Capitol. And they say, we'll help you. So we got up five in the morning. We took three buses full of people from the community to protect the cuts. I was in every news the following day in Illinois. And I have just arrived here. Everybody knew who I was. Adapted to the circumstances. Went to Springfield in a jacket 
no tie, no suits, no fancy, be part of the community, holding hands, okay? Demanding government responsibility to take care of the people who are poor. No fear. That's leadership. It's the power. Doing those kinds of things in life that you believe is the right thing. Anything that you could do for humanity that you think is the right thing, even if you are wrong, you will never be wrong. Because so it's I authentic huh? place. Because it's coming from such an authentic place. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I have to say too, your your way of leadership is really bridging the gaps, right, between leaders of healthcare and the community served and really building that trust within leaders. And that involves, like you said, collaboration with local leaders and, and politics and partnerships and things like that. And I know that Link, your time at Lincoln Hospital, Lincoln Hospital has such a history with community activism with the young lords when they you know, took over and they were demanding better healthcare and that rich history there. Um, can you talk about some of the initiatives and kind of like um, the ways you were trying to engage the community with more awareness of what you're doing? Um, can you talk a little bit how you did that, how you engage with that community? Well, I think the, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I recognize always in my career is that I am what I am uh, because there were a group of others mm -hmm. who actually uh, sacrificed themselves, who went to jail, who actually were arrested uh, for demanding better health condition in, in the Bronx. And uh, with some of those leaders, I didn't get along, but I respected them for what they did. And I, and I will tell you without any fear to tell you who they were. I mean, I think I never really got along well with Carmen Arroyo. Uh, she didn't like me for, for whatever reason it was behind that. But I respected her as someone who gave many of her years to be, to have a CEO at Lincoln Hospital that was Puerto Rican. That would have never happened because of George Rodriguez, Carmen Arroyo, uh, and there. Uh, the uh, people who fought for the community, uh, who demanded the Latino will be leading. And if I recall the transition of what happened during the takeover uh, of the Lincoln Hospital by the young Lord, um, I became very close to Felipe Luciano. Mm -hmm. And I learned from him. But that movement actually um, had an impact bigger than just taking over the hospital. It demanded better health conditions for the Puerto Rican community. Demanded a better building, okay? But behind all of that was Carmen Arroyo and was Georgie Rodriguez, Ramon Vélez. Whether you agree with Ramon Vélez or not, or what he did, he was there, all of Antonetti, another leader from, from the community who um, who were there. So for me, I, I went to the top and I rose to the top of being the CEO of the hospital because the sacrifices of all of these people. Those people impacted the community, impacted healthcare. And when I, you know, I went to New York City when they uh, did the film take take over, um, uh, that actually the one who um, the director for the movie was Luis Miranda, and since we go back, 
they told me they were going to do that. So I went to uh, there and I saw so many community leaders there um, watching the film. But that takeover actually created something that it was un unintended. The, the takeover was just basically to say, we want a new hospital. We need better care. You cannot continue to, to die, to kill our people in the Bronx. But out of that takeover, one of the first national safety uh, policy or healthcare came out of that movement, which today is basically a policy that exists regulated by the accreditation of all hospital, which is patient safety. The things that you saw, the infection that happened, the patient who died, the woman who, women who died giving birth at Lincoln Hospital that actually created this whole movement that people will go there and they will die. Many of those policy has been implemented nationally. So the takeover, and the work uh, of the young Lord at that time, when they took that action, created an impact, not only in the Bronx and for the Puerto Rican community, created an impact nationwide when it comes to healthcare. So these are the things that we need to recognize. Like I said, I, I um, and when, when and it's quite interesting, the person who took over the hospital, there were no Puerto Rican doctors at that time who wanted to take over Lincoln Hospital. So the Puerto Rican community, as pride, as proud as they were with the Puerto Rican people to do it, to have somebody that would lead the hospital, they selected a Puerto Rican, a Dominican doctor, Dr. Michelin. And I learned that from your great grandfather, George Rodriguez, gave me the whole history. Because he was part of the selection of who was going to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a great history of um, learning from all of these things here. So I also just need to ask you this because um, when I think of my grandfather and names like Jose Sanchez, I think Boricua pioneers, right? I think um, with the specific mission of improving quality of life. Can you just tell me a little bit more of how you got to know my grandfather and what was leadership like with him? Uh, well, your grandfather was one of the toughest guys that I ever met. Never backed down. Um, he was a great friend and a colleague to me. But he was also, he challenged me continuously. I hated those meetings with him. <laughs> and I have to meet with him and the community for 12 years every month. And um, uh, he cares about the people. He cares about the hospital. He talked about Lincoln Hospital as my hospital. And he would say, you are the CEO, but that is not your hospital. It is my hospital. <laughs> and these were the things that actually resonated with me. But not only he did it for the Bronx, so he got involved in the, um, the, the each hospital had a, advisory board, a community advisory board. And in that community advisory board, George Rodriguez was the leader of all of the advisory board in the city of New York, in Brooklyn, Staten Island, all, where, all of the hospitals were located. Everyone knew George Rodriguez. Presidents or hospitals would come and negotiate with him, okay? Um, um, I remember he finished his term and he was 
so determined that he will never leave that position because he was the chair of the community advisory board of Lincoln Hospital. And then he uh, will never want to give it up. So then uh, the president of the hospital says to him, you have to step down because your term is up. After much negotiation, he stepped down and he put someone to replace him. And the last day that, because he could come back in a year later, when he learned that that year, it was already a year, he came back and he says, I want to be on, on the board. And he came back to be on the board and he was the chair of the board. You know, and that's the level of tenacity, determination that he had. I learned from him that he says to me all the time, you know, we, the leaders in the Bronx, people think that we have no education, but we all have a PhD. And you say, I said, George, come on, can you explain this to me? Our hunger and determination, PhD. We all have to this here. That's, that's who he was. That's level of, of, and then he attacked me often for not doing things in the hospital. But then he will call me and he will say, you need to know that I'm doing this because I have to do this for my community. It's not personal. I got married on July 4th. Every July 4th, George Rodriguez will call me and will call my wife. Always. Never Christmas, holiday, George will call my house. My daughter will call my daughter. And and he used to say, I mean, I don't agree with what he said. He used to say, you are the best CEO of the Lincoln Hospital ever had. Okay. Always the best. And there was this tension between him and Ramon Valle from time to time. In public, they were best of friends. Back door in an office, they were not the best of friends. And, you know, at that time, Ramon Valle was a powerhouse in the Bronx. Uh, but that, that movement, I mean, those were the leaders at that time and in the Bronx, and I needed to work with each one of them. And um, um, George was very special. I learned a great deal from him. We have fights, disagreements, but always protected me. Never let me down. And when there were movement in the Bronx or anything, because there was, you know, those community situations in the Bronx is like, I mean, I remember when um, New mayor took over the office and I was there. And then they sent a group to talk to the borough president. And they the borough president says, we don't want Jose Sanchez at Lincoln anymore. George Kane told me, and he said, you going nowhere. There is a movement, people don't like you because they're jealous of the work that you do here. I left Lincoln on my own term. Never. And uh, every time I went to New York from here, I called George. When I talked to George. Okay. And uh, 
Um, and, and the last time I went to see him, I was in New York and I walk into a room and um, he didn't recognize me anymore. And uh, I kept saying, I am your CEO. But, uh, and then I learned that he passed on and, and I was very proud that they named street after him, mm -hmm. right in front of the hospital. Right in front of Lincoln. Right in front of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And then you go inside the hospital and you go to the corridor that take you into the parking lot. Mm -hmm. There are many pictures with George and I together. Mm -hmm. But of course, I look different. I actually that have it right here, if you can see. <laughs> yep. Always you got it. <laughs> he was an incredible man. You should feel very proud of that man. I am. And and just going off of that, um, you took in all of that wisdom and all that um, leadership from those who came before you. Um, so what advice would you give to young Puerto Ricans now aspiring to make positive impacts on their communities? And not just Puerto Ricans, you know, any young Latino, black and brown, any any type that want to really make an impact? First, I mean, I, I would say, I always think that um, uh, you must have an education to, if you want to, I, I would advise all of the uh, Latino leaders to uh, young people to um, uh, get an education because that opened doors for you. Um, the other thing is that take serious what you do um, and find something that you have a passion for it that you love, care for. Because if you do, I, I also sometimes reflect on myself, why do I do everything that I do? But I do all of these things because I love what I do. I don't have any, any uh, regret. I don't get up in the morning and say, I don't want to go to the hospital. I look forward to come here every single day. And then I find um, also uh, uh, situations where I'm supposed to have a three o'clock meeting, they're knocking my door now, uh, and is to be creative in life. Just don't think about doing the same thing over and over. Just be creative. Roberto Clemente High School was graduating a group of Puerto Rican kids. And then um, the principal of the school called me and she said, I would like you to, you have a great career. Many of these kids came from where you came from. I want you to come and talk to them um, in the school. And I said to her, no, I'm not, I, I'm not gonna do that. And she was shocked and she says, what do you propose? I said, well, can you take them all, those kids to my house? Can you bust them? So I live in a fancy building in downtown Chicago. I pulled in front of the building a, a bus with all of these kids from Roberto Clemente High School. And the people in the building were shocked where all of these kids are going. So they were going to the 11th floor of the building where I live. I got all of these kids. I sat them on the floor. I gave them Coke, Coca-Cola and sodas. And I talked about me and I talked my life. And I said, my message to all of you is that you could get out of poverty and live like this. Because I feel kids think about visual concrete things, not talking to them. At that time, all of these kids wanted to meet with me on a regular basis. And then I, we agreed that they would identify one that would be the liaison between them and I, because I cannot meet with 20 kids on a regular basis. 
that youngster who they identify as a woman, young lady, became elected the first Latino older person in Chicago. She's a member of the city council. And that's what you need to do. So I would advise you to be creative, to be engaged, to have knowledge, and love what you do. You don't love what you do, you're never going to be great in what you want to do. I never, never planned my career. What am I going to do five years from now, three years from now? I never worry about money. Like people who wants to make money, I never worry about it. Everything came, just came. Leadership roles, positions, you know, nice compensation. Never thought about it. I never quit. I never, as a matter of fact, Through my whole career, I had never looked for work. My bosses recommend me to the next level. Mm -hmm. Hardworking, loyal to people. You have to be loyal to the people you care for. This is one of the most inspirational all the histories I've conducted. Huh? This is, has to be one the most inspirational oral history I've ever conducted. It's 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 awesome. Uh, this is going to mean a lot to a lot of people, especially here in the Bronx. You know, uh, Michelle, your idea of reaching out to the old guard, you know, uh, is awesome. And uh, we we appreciate this time with you, uh, Dr. Sanchez. And we have one final question, unless Michelle, you have any more. You can do it. And we like to end all our oral histories with this last question. Can you hold on one second? Let me tell these people to yes. <laughs> That is awesome. That is awesome that he's coming back to answer this last question. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when I... he has to do his I have a few more minutes. Okay, go ahead. Jose Sanchez, what does the Bronx mean to you? Um, hope, the opportunities, remember, opportunities come from having nothing in life. The Bronx for me was a land of opportunities for a young man who wants to grow and develop because there were so many challenges at that time when I was there, that as difficult as it was, I saw this as a great opportunity. I said to myself, I'm gonna be great here in the Bronx because the Bronx is gonna make me great with all the challenges that they have, you know? I mean, I remember going to, I set up a clinic right across the street from Ramon Vélez's office. And everybody told me that Ramon Vélez was a tough guy. And then I got a call from Ramon Vélez and he says, hey, what are you doing? You are coming into my territory? Why are you doing that? And then I said, uh, Mr. Vélez, I am not going to discuss this with you over the phone. Um, if you have time, I will drive over to your office and I have a conversation with you. I drove over to Ramon Vélez and I said, Ramon, our community is dying and they don't have care. Another clinic in front of you? I don't want to take businesses away from you. I want to provide our community with the health care that they need. And between you and I, we do not have enough. Why don't we work together to provide more services to everyone? He got up and he gave me a hug. 
it could have been a fight. So the Bronx for me taught me to negotiate, taught me to look up opportunities, taught me to look for innovation, to include everyone. And that actually um, is the Bronx. The Bronxes have actually shaped, it shaped my life being there. 12 years and leaving Lincoln Hospital. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanchez. Okay, Michelle, all the best. Always okay. available. Pastor Crespo or Michelle, if you need anything, just let me know. Thank you. And it's still a diehard New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> all right have a great day sir good luck with your next meeting thank you take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.